Okay, this is the City of Northampton Compensation Board meeting for April 10th, 1923 at 5.30 on a Monday. And I'm letting everybody know that this is being recorded. Um, and uh, and I, the first order of business, I think, is to, I don't have it right in front of me, does somebody else, oh, here we go, um, is to do a roll call. All Sam, right. Can you please I'll do that? I'll take it away. John. I'm here. Um, I don't see Tara yet. Uh, Felicia. Here. Deb. <laughs> Sam is here. Javier. Has changed. Here. And Peter. Here. All right, we have a quorum. Excellent. All right, so the first um, order of business is to approve the minutes from our last meeting, which was March 13th. Um, does anybody, anybody wanna make a um, motion to approve those? So moved. Any seconds? Uh, maybe we should ask first if anybody has any amendment or comment in relation to the minutes. Sure, we can do that. Does anybody have any comments or edits or any, any, thank you very much, Javier. Anything uh, concerning the last minutes? Okay, uh, if there are no comments, now can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. And second? Second. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, all right. Did, I can't remember. Do we have to do the roll call again? Right? It's been a month, so I forget these things. We do. I'll go ahead. Um, Felicia. <laughs> I think that was the palm of approval. Yes. <laughs> I am here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Deb, your vote on to approve the minutes? I think I have to abstain because I wasn't there. They look, I read them, they look fine, but. You don't, you're not required to abstain, but oh, you're, well, it's I up to you if you want to vote yes or abstain. I can vote yes, they look great to me, having not been there. <laughs> I, Sam votes yes. Javier? Yep. Peter? Yes. John? Yep. Tara, we're doing a roll call uh, to approve the minutes. If you want to vote, you may. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Just in time. Thanks. Okay. Yes, uh, I approve the minutes. Great. They are approved unanimously. I will um, send them into the clerk's office. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, next up is um, public comment, um, but there doesn't seem anybody on but the board. Um, so does anybody, I don't even know if there would be anything that would be mandated or, or would qualify as, as, a, as a public comment from any of us. So we'll move on to the discussion items. Um, team updates. Alicia, I think it would be great to talk about your data. Sure. So uh, we sent the survey out about two-ish weeks ago now. Um, unfortunately, we were only able to obtain the email addresses for current elected officials. So, you know, I do wish we were able to get some more historical data on that, but it is what it is. Um, and we had pretty decent turnout. We had 23 people respond to it in total, uh, which is two more people. I was just I was just checking it. That's two more people than um, when I sent out the preliminary results last Sunday before the meeting. And the one thing that really surprised me about going through the data, I don't know how much you guys really looked at it, but most people kind of had like pretty even amount of like positive and negative for the compensation piece. So a lot of people kind of said at first, I was really surprised when I started, when these results started trickling in, a lot of people said, yeah, they thought the compensation was fair. Uh, and then that ended up kind of 
going more in the other direction where more people said no it was they did not consider it fair but it was still pretty close like it wasn't this overwhelming amount of people who said no I don't think it's fair mm -hmm. um the other thing that I thought was rather interesting is um you know there was a lot of people who mentioned the benefits of the health insurance um as as kind of like a positive thing in having the um, the elected position. A lot of people also talked about the the time that it takes and the fact that a lot of the meetings are at night. They mentioned that that came up a lot. Um, in terms of the demographics, they were pretty. Um, I wouldn't say like mixed, but I I feel like it's it wasn't anything that stood out. There was no. Um, you know, like pretty much 50-50 male-female. Um, and then of course some, you know, decided not to say. Um, generally ages were kind of all over the place. Income was kind of all over the place. Even education was kind of all over the place. So there was really nothing that was, I guess, too strange about that. Um, Cause I feel like that's actually kind of good that it was a little bit of a mix because that's what you want your elected officials to be is a mix that represents everybody. Um, so, so in general, I was just kind of interested in the fact that, um, a lot of people really didn't have very many negative things to say. I thought it was going to be a lot more negative than it was. And it was actually a lot more positive than expected, not necessarily overwhelmingly positive, but more positive than I expected. Um, Javier, do you have a question? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, um, I haven't seen it. So the uh in relation to race and demographic mm -hmm. can you sort of talk about it a little bit what you're seeing yeah so i he will here I'll, i can share my screen so that um if you let me share my screen <laughs> so that way everybody can see it hold on a second um you can you should be able to share it now. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this is the, the demographic portion of the survey. So as I was saying, there really isn't any like overwhelming um, majority of people that make up this, this survey. Uh, so fairly close to 50-50 in terms of uh, you know, those who chose to identify a gender. Um, for race ethnicity, this one is written in. So uh, the majority is white. But right here with the ages and the household income and the education, uh, it's, it's pretty spread out, um, which I thought was good because most people in an elected position, you want to make up, you know, a general mix of the population. Um, and then that was it for the demographic questions. Javier, you still, you still have a question? Yeah. Do you need me to go to something else? Yeah, no, I, you know, we do know that, so Northampton only had in the full history of city council, only two black men holding position, right? Garrick, who is now, uh, serving as a city council member in um, John Ford in the same word last uh, last sort of least latest session of the city council, right? And we have never had a Latino elected official in the city, in no position, in no elect, in neither city council or mayor office, and we have only one black woman uh, elected who, right now. Who is Jamila? So I, I want to, I, I, I want to push back a little bit about this sense of, well, this is a really diverse group. Well, it is diverse among you know white people. And and I think that's also a good point too, just because in keeping with remembering that this is only a pool of our, like in general, this entire survey is only a pool of our current elected officials and is not any historical elected officials. Did you have another question, Javier? 
or another point that you wanted me to go back to? No, no, this is this is awesome. I mean, oh, okay. I'm, 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 the hand I, I, still I, shows. I, uh, it's the problem is I'm in my phone, so it's not. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the main issues that we're seeing across the board with the city is the kind of data points that they are collecting, right? One of the reasons why with my other select committee, uh, we were able to get, you know, 150 answers was because a lot of people are using their private personal emails when they serve, which by itself has some issues, right? But when you have elected officials in the position of a school committee, city council, and the mayor, the city is giving them uh, a city email, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And, and I'm giving this recommendation with my select committee, which I just finished writing the report today. Um, maybe recommending the, and I think John, you told me we were running to each other on <laughs> Saturday or Sunday. And I think making a point of the kind of data that we feel the city should be collecting mm -hmm. for general purposes, I think, you know, this is one of those that we really want to know, right? The, the, the historical information in relationship to race and demographics of the city council, probably going back 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that they are going to be able to get it, but they, to get, to be able to start having the data, they have to decide when to start gathering the data. Right. Um, that's a really good point, Javier. Um, I, can we read, I'd like to return to that point when we start looking, uh, when we talk about maybe some, some of the considerations that would go into the report. Okay, that's great. Cause I think that that would be, um, seems like it would, it would fit in there very well. Okay, Felicia, what else do we have with the report? Anything? Um, well, I was just gonna say, I can go back to the questions too, just so that they're um, more easily available for people to see. Um, one thing I also noticed is I think there was oh. definitely some. Felicia, I'm sorry, Deb has a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you. Um, I I also think Javier's point is really good. But my question wasn't at, to that point. I was going to ask. You said that we could only get the current officials' emails, and I just want to raise the issue of would it be helpful if I mean if we could somehow get to pre you know previous people and why is it that we can't and maybe what Javier spoke to about using a different source of email gathering you know I'd like to discuss more about that I mean I know we may not have time to do that here in the time frame that we have the trajectory but it just seems that to maybe this is a slice that is representative but maybe like a five or six year back would be more representative and also if it's on government email there may be a reluctance for people to be as forthcoming i think was was javier's point too so anyway that's all i just wanted to, to kind of find out if there was any idea about going to a, an audience beyond the current officials yeah, I can just I can answer part of that. I I had talked uh, to Jim Nash, and I'd also talked to the city about this. And um, it, precisely the issue at its core is the fact that when you're an elected official, you're given a specific email that's tied to the city, and then once you leave, that email doesn't exist anymore. Um, nor are our individuals' um, personal emails then because something that that's public. If we happen to know what their emails are, and we had some personal connections, then we could draw on those. But there's not a database anywhere that exists um, of of what those emails would be, or or if the city needs to get in touch with people. Um, so it wasn't. What we ended up having to do is to go online and, and all of the information for the current emails is all public. We just went through and picked out as literally as many as we could get. And frankly, even all those weren't completely correct. Um, some of the web pages hadn't been kept up to date and all that. Um, so we we basically pieced together what we could. Um, I, I was a little surprised as well that it, it wasn't more thorough than that. Sam? Um, 
Felicia, I'm wondering if any of, I think you just said two more responses came in since you sent us the preliminary. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that it, seven out of nine responses were city councilors to, oh, I'm sorry, seven responses were city councilors. That's out of nine total. Two responses were Smith Folk trustees. That's out of three total, but only three out of 10 school committee members responded. Were any of the additional responses school committee members? So I believe the two additional were these two at the top here, a city councilor and a Smith Folk uh, trustee. But um, I'll, um, I was also gonna say not all of the people answered all of the questions. Um, and then of course the first two were like, I, I did like tests. <laughs> so that's why they down here says tests. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's helpful. And I, so I just wanna note that like, we're not getting a good response from school committee members, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanna acknowledge that Karen Foster has joined us from Ward 2. Um, which we really appreciate. So um, I, I'm not sure, Karen, whether you came on just to listen or whether you want to answer some questions, that would be wonderful. But right now we're um, walking through the survey that was sent out um, and getting some some data and Felicia, maybe after a few minutes when you're done, then we can um, see if Karen has any specific questions or comments. Yeah, that sounds good. Um... I, I mean, I, I'm totally fine so that we to talk to, have, to let Karen talk so that we don't waste your time. My Zoom controls are being very bizarre, so I can't end my screen sharing right now. Are you able to end it for me? <laughs> oh, uh, let's see if we can end it. Um, wow, it's, that's a good one. It's like stuck at the bottom and won't let me like bring it back up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Never mind. Okay. Oh, okay. there we go. There right. we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry right. about that. <laughs> Um, thanks, Felicia. That's great so far. So we'll go back and take a look at that. So, um, Karen, thanks for joining us. And Javier has his hand up. Oh, Javier. I thought that I didn't know whether it was a leftover from uh, Felicia. Did you see a correlation? Because, you know, seeing that uh, as one thing at a time doesn't make any sense, right? For an analysis, but interconnecting the different data points. When you were talking about, you know, people, some, some group of people being fine with uh, the pay, do you see a correlation in relation to the amount of dependence that people that fill out the survey uh, stated having? Um, I believe we ended up getting rid of that question. So there isn't a question on here about how many dependents or household people somebody has in their family or that they live with. And we talked a lot about that. I think it might've been at one of the meetings um, at a time, maybe when you weren't here, but I think we ended up, we went really in depth into what a dependent was and what it meant to have people in your house and support people and not support people. So we got rid of that question altogether. Um, so I guess my answer is no, I did not so, see any correlation because there, there was none to be made. Okay. Okay, that's concerning for me, uh, mostly because you know, in our survey, we're seeing that at least more than a little more than 50% of the people filling out our survey for board and commission are making more than $100,000 and around 30% are doing more than $200,000 a year. And most of them don't have dependents, which is a correlation also of the fact that most of the people serving in board and commission in Northampton are old, which means that their kids are either out of the house or in college. So for a person saying that the meager salary of a city council, Karen, with all respect, <laughs> it's enough, I think that's, that's a correlation. I mean, you know, if I'm making X amount of money on this side, or I have, you know, a uh, generation of wealth, and I, my kids are out of the house, any kind of payment is gonna be good. So I, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. I was, I, as you said, probably was not here when you guys talk about it, uh, but that would have been a really important data point for the point of view that 
dependence is a, it's a, at the end of the day, it's a correlation of how little or how big your income becomes each month. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we had a lot of questions around it, Javier, um, as Felicia just said, in terms of what qualified as a dependent, how many people were under the roof. It was, it got pretty complicated for us. Um, I would say, uh, I think that there's, if we decide as a group that we want to drastically increase, as an example, how much um, that pay is, there are, I think there are other issues that we can use to address that. Um, the point being taken, yeah, it would be great to have that data. I don't think we, we're not going to have the data, um, but we do know that it seems like at the core, this group has decided that making sure that these positions um, are, are ones that would attract a greater diversity of candidates uh, I think that we have some other data points to lean to uh, that would help us with that argument. Yeah, I I, I sort of understand that. Uh, I you know again I was not here, but for me, just being able to have the def to define dependent anybody who is under my like who is being supported by my income would I would have suffice right? Uh, could be you know. Uh, a brother with a uh, with a uh, with a disability, a sister, or whatever. Or I'm taking care of my mother, or I have kids. Any mm -hmm. dependent that, at the end of the day, the you know because of the nature of the dependent, it's under my income, and it's it's somebody that depends on my earnings would have so funny. But you know, I mean, it's it, it. yeah. Um, I think that those are, I, I, we don't necessarily have the data points, but that's certainly information that we could include in the report to justify whatever decision we decide to go in. Um, I do, if, if people don't have questions, I would like to, to uh, get Karen in on the conversation and or if we have specific questions for Karen, and maybe this is one of them, we get an opportunity to ask those. Um, so Karen, welcome to the meeting. You're, you're our first visitor ever. So um, <laughs> I feel like we should give you a little prize or something. <laughs> oh, I feel bad. I've been meaning to come earlier and I've had conflicts on so many Monday nights, but I just, just dropped one kid off at baseball and I'm walking the dog out in the woods and happy to talk to you. All right, great. Yeah. Well, thanks Thanks for letting us accompany you through the woods. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, um, do you have any comments or questions for us at all? <sighs> it's been, I've, I've read some of the minutes of your meetings. Um, I appreciated the survey that you've done. And I, you know, I think it's a, it's a challenging task laid out before you. I, you know, I just appreciated your conversation about how compensation can. Oh, we just lost your sound, Karen. Oh, there we go. How's that? Am, am I back? Better. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, I just heard your, your conversation about how compensation can be tied to a greater diversity of people running and, and, that's an exciting direction. And, and I have to admit, I haven't looked into state law yet, but there's been a part of me that wonders if there's like sliding scale compensation that could be available or what kind of really kind of out of the box ways we could look at elected official compensation, because it's true as Javier mentioned, that stipend means different things to different people, depending on our, on how many dependents we have and our, you know, our, whether or not we have access to generational wealth and our, and our other jobs and, and all of those things. So that's a, it's a really interesting conversation, but I don't know what state law allows. So I, I may have opened a Pandora's box. It's already closed. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know either on that. I, I okay. couldn't find anything when I was doing some research, but okay. I'm, I'm hardly an expert on this. Um, yes, Sam, you've got a question. Just to a response to Councillor Foster is that I raised this early on. Um, but I think we poo-pooed it pretty quickly because we have a really tight timeline and right. understanding a sliding scale takes a lot of research and knowledge, especially because there isn't a lot of precedent to that across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, as a group, just so you, as you can probably get, uh, get the gist of it from us talking is that we have been looking at this question since we started. And we do want to make sure that it's 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 part of the plan, it's part of the consideration, and part of the recommendations that we make. Um, we're still hashing out those exact details, but it is getting baked into all of this. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, what other comments or or is anyone from uh, the board have questions? 
Tara. Hi, everybody. Um, happy Monday. I just wanted to say thank you to Councillor Foster for being here and for all the great work that you do, um, both on the city council and for the nonprofit All Out Adventures. Um, I really appreciate you. And I guess, you know, if you were us, what questions would you be asking um, elected mm -hmm. officials? Like we asked that on the survey. Do you feel like we missed anything? No, um, that's, that's a great question, Tara. Um, I thought the survey was well done. The only thing that was a little tricky, and I think it's just sort of the nature of what is, is that the survey was sort of asking about, right, what we're paid in our other position or how many hours we work. And there's no great, I don't know that there's any great way to get at this with data, but what is the compensation that would attract a greater diversity? And that's the tricky thing. And, and sometimes it's a conversation too I've had with people who want city councilors to have more authority and power than we do under the charter, you know, have wanted us to, to make many decisions that are in the mayor's purview. And one of the things I've, I've shared with, with people is, you know, the city councilors by nature of the compensation, it's a very, very part-time position. And so there's, there's also this balance of like, you know, the mayor's office or staff are doing this professionally and making many decisions that, that people who are, you know, in this very part-time role don't have the time to do the research. Um, so that's just one of the things. And, and it seems to, I think, line up with the charter in that way, in that we don't have a ton of authority. And I think that's an important consideration, um, you know, kind of what we want our counselors to do and tied to compensation. But Abigail? it's not a part-time, oh. not part-time. Well, that's I mean, <laughs> it is a tricky thing to answer. There's weeks, maybe I work 20 hours on council work and there's weeks, maybe five, and sometimes it's 40, you know, so it is a really tricky thing to, to answer. Oh. But, hey, Javier, you have a question. Stop. So Karen, I'm, Karen, I'm gonna push back a little bit in what something that you said. Um, the city council, one of the main sort of, you know, Stormhampton has a, a strong mayor sort of government with a, with a interpretation of the city charter by the mayor and the city solicitor pretty clear about what they think city council should do and should not do. But certainly one of the tasks that city council has is with appropriations and with the, with the, with a, with a gigantic massive uh, approval of a budget and i mean based on my experience working with you know with many 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 city councils around the commonwealth is that i mean i see that many times because of the nature of that you know meager salary plus part-time nature of it there is not a lot of understanding or analysis or time to be able to do even research for the city council in relationship to the budget. And, and you know, many times I see some city council being, because of this, being highly deferential to the mayor and or a city uh, department uh, person in relation to what they are asking, right? So my concern comes from the point of view of I want those deciding where millions and millions and millions of dollars are gonna go to have enough time to be able to do whatever they need to do to understand the budget, to research the budget and to get the answers that they feel they need so that sort of legislated body fully functional, right? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. And I think that that's very much up to sort of each individual counselor, right, um, the amount of, of research and work um, that we do, and then also putting that in the circumstances of people's lives, um, as you talked about, depending on how many dependents they have, or the nature of their work, or, you know, what, what kind of bandwidth they have to allocate toward it. And that's, that's also a decision that the voters get to make, too, is, right, if their representative is, you know, kind of undertaking what they would want to see their representative undertaking. Great, what other questions or comments? Uh, 
Um, one question I have is as you're looking at other similarly sized cities with, you know, similarly sized elected bodies, um, kind of what ranges you're seeing, or is that, is that a benchmark that you're using? It is a benchmark yeah. that we've been using. Um, it's been, to be honest, the last few years, it's been hard to get the data. Uh, mm -hmm. Sam did a lot of work. I'm she can speak to all that, but, um, during COVID, I think a, a lot of this data just wasn't collected. There were a lot of other things that became priorities. The What we have the most data for, but not for every city, is the mayor's position. Um, and for the cities that we looked at, we had about, I can't remember how many exact cities, but we of the cities we looked at and then the mayor's data, I think there's seven or eight cities. Um, the average there, I think, was around um, 127,000 somewhere around there. Um, and then we've also looked at uh, what's the cost of living increase, which has not increased for these positions in nine years. And uh, that's a cumulative increase of 27%, which puts, you know, would also put that uh, mayor's position just around that same ballpark as an example. Um, mm -hmm. Sam, I don't remember, we didn't have as comprehensive data for other positions. Um, is that right? Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Um, I okay. was planning on sharing that tonight. Is it appropriate to, I mean, I'm not going to read every single thing, but I can answer Councillor Foster's question. Yes, please do that. Okay. So um, the board um, said to look at Western Massachusetts cities with the um, mayor council form of government. So just cities, not towns. Um, and that were similar to Northampton, both in population size and um, median household income. So with those parameters, I was able to identify six um, cities to use as benchmarking. So it's Agawam, East Hampton, Greenfield, Pittsfield, West Springfield, and Westfield. Um, so I'm just going to go through, I have to bear with me, I have to sort my table, but starting um, looking at the mayor's, I just, here we go. Looking at the mayor's salary, we're the second lowest, um, with the lowest being East Hampton at 83,000 and the highest being West Springfield at 120,000. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, actually, so city council president, um, there's a stipend. This is actually, I'm not gonna cover that. I'm just gonna do a counselor at large, um, a counselor stipend, and that ranges Northampton's actually right in the middle with the lowest being 2,000 in Greenfield, the highest being 14,000 in Westfield and Northampton's in the middle with 9,000. Um, and then of course there's, we have a president stipend and a at-large stipend as well. Hmm. Looking at school committees. So interestingly enough, two of these cities, they um, amended their charters to have a chair who's someone other than the mayor. Um, and those folks have a separate stipend for the chair. Um, but looking at a school committee member stipend, Northampton again is in the middle um, with the lowest being $0 compensation in Pittsfield and the highest being $8,680 in Westfield. And Northampton is at 5,000 for both um, a school committee member and a Smith Folk trustee. Great. So Sam, I'll have to definitely want to compare some data with you after this, because there was some little bit of crunching I did on the mayor's position that took into account other cities, but um, we can compare that and come back. Peter? Uh, thank you. Uh, Sam, what about the benefits, the health insurance and the retirement? I don't have that information because we don't have, um, I mean, Someone is welcome to look that up. I simply did not have time. You know, I pulled everyone's budget manually. I pulled all of these by reading different charters. Um, previously in the last report, there was a benchmarking survey done by Massachusetts Municipal Association or MMA. People have not responded recently, which is why I just started pulling it on my own. I don't have information. It's not thorough. It's not gonna be apples to apples from the last benchmarking. Thank you, because that's that's a that's a huge. I mean, the if somebody takes advantage of just the health insurance, it could double their compensation or more. So it's it's a uh, it's it's hard to say 
we're in the middle or the high end or low end if we don't know that information. I, at least I think so. Yeah, and I was referring only to stipends. Mm -hmm. um, Sam, we have the data on how many people in the city use the insurance? We yeah. do. Um, I sent that out previously, and if you give me a moment, I can pull it up, but I don't have it right in front of me yet. Karen, did you just say something? I didn't. No, okay. but Sam, will you pull that up? You brought up your your benchmarking brought up two two comments that um, were in the recesses of my mind. One is I'd be curious to know how the work of the school committee has changed in the last few years. Like sometimes I've looked at the number of meetings they've had, and I would guess that it's probably more than we've had as city councilors. And so that that's just something that I'd put out there to consider. And the other is about the stipend for the president. Um, I believe it's five hundred dollars in Northampton, if I'm right. And um, I would say the the increased amount of work that the city council president has is um, significantly more than that difference in compensation shows. Yeah, Karen, I don't have data on that, but anecdotally talking to people on council, that's what I've heard. Mm -hmm. Especially with social media and, and being on 24 seven. For the count for the president or, or, yeah, we're actually, we just actually had this discussion kind of in the background um, because our city council doesn't have uh, official social media channels. And, um, you know, the, the counselor that brought that up said that the, she doesn't use her own social media um, because of the sort of 24 seven expectation of moderating. And to be perfectly frank, that's why I don't use it for, for council either. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's a piece of it. But even in the background of just, um, you know, when Jim Nash went, went out of town for a couple of weeks in the fall, the amount of extra legwork um, that I did when I was filling in for him on a fairly light agenda was kind of shocking. Um, and the amount of like questions and, and phone calls and things that he's putting together in between meetings, it's, it's really significant. I think it's, it's much more than um, anyone would imagine. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that came up a lot in the survey, just, just to mention it, is a lot of people said, you know, I, basically with my, with the amount of I'm getting for the stipend, it's like, I'm making like $10 an hour, if that may be. <laughs> um, and they also, a lot of people said in terms of why they are either deciding they might not run again in the future or why they had friends that chose not to run or you know, people in the community that they knew of that didn't run. The biggest thing that kept coming up was the time commitment. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that was, that was the thing that really plagued people. And I think the time commitment wouldn't be such a big deal for people if it was, you know, the compensation was more worth it. Yeah, that's tricky. I'm not running again. Um, and somebody asked me that exact question of would a higher compensation make a difference? But, you know, for me with a full-time job, I, I, that pays a reasonable amount. I don't know that it would, it was really the time commitment, but for somebody who's juggling things, or if, if a larger stipend were to say, allow me to drop down to part-time or, you know, other, or pay for other, um, you know, sort of tasks to take other things off my plate, very, very possibly it could be worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, All right. Yes. I have two things. One, I can, I have the information, um, but also I just I want to respond to something Councillor Foster said about you're curious about school committee. Um, I am as well, which is why I noted that we don't have a good representation of them. Um, and I I have my own strong feelings on you know the amount of work they're doing and if that's in line with their job, um, in line with what the Mass General Law says their job is. Um, so I'd be curious to get more responses from them and anecdotally have heard from several people, um, I know that this is very skewed to my own circle, that folks have chosen not to run for school committee because the amount of time they're spending in meetings and meetings that go till 2 a.m., et cetera. So I would be very curious to know from more school committee members um, how much time they are spending on the job and how much time they think they should be spending on um, what is a part-time position according to the charter. Um, in response to 
Peter's question, or maybe it was John's question about who's enrolled um, in the health insurance plan. So um, there are six, this is FY23 um, from Northampton's Human Resources Department. There are six city councilors enrolled in the plan um, with a cost of a little over $86,000. One school committee member at the cost of um, $15,000, a little over $15,000 two Smith um, vocational trustees at the cost of about 19,500. So that's nine total um, elected officials enrolled out of 21 total at the grand total of $121,000, a little over $121,000. In comparison to the 2014 report, it's the same number of elected officials, but it obviously is a different total amount because costs have gone up. Thanks, Sam. Sam, I just, I have a quick question on that. Um, is, are the, are the counselors and the school members, do they pay a portion of that or is that the amount that the city pays for them? That's the amount the city pays. Um, and I believe Councilor Foster, correct me if I'm wrong, it's 80, 20. Is this split? I'm, I'm, it's 80 20. Um, I use the city's family plan, and that plus flexible spending is my stipend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really significant benefit, um, especially significant. from. Yeah, especially from an HR perspective. And if the city is paying 80% of the health insurance and it's a decent plan, then, you know, I, I would say, like you said, that's basically like an extra stipend in and of itself, which is also what Peter alluded to earlier. Okay, any other yeah, questions? May, may I, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, I just, maybe Karen should know this. Uh, Karen, when the last time there was a committee like ours, it was 2014. And uh, the, the, that committee recommended basically doubling the stipends and eliminating the health insurance uh, because they felt like you know, only some people were taking advantage. And it was for those people, it was you really, you know, they were getting so, so much more. And that's 10 years, almost 10 years ago when health insurance was less than half of now. Um, and the city council elected to. Uh, they, they elected to accept the doubling of the stipend, but still keep the benefits, which kind of shot the whole <laughs> committee's work to hell. Uh, yeah, I remember that debate, although I wasn't quite in the circle, um, you know, to be, to be any part of it at the time. But I think, you know, I would say that the benefit of the health insurance is probably one of the greatest things that can help to increase the diversity of who's serving because it opens up the door to people who don't necessarily, or it provides a lure um, to people who don't necessarily have full-time jobs with benefits, right? So that, um, you know, I think it, it would make it, you know, kind of more plausible for, say a single parent or a consultant or somebody with part-time work or you know some of the kind of less traditional paths um, to be able to serve if they had access to the city's health insurance. So I, I think that that's probably pretty significant. I'm sure that's true. Deb, you got a question? Um, it just, as we discuss this more, I'm just feeling like this is an essential part of this work because we really aren't able to embrace the entire and have a comparison really. So I'm wondering if there's a way that we could incorporate this information, you know, in a kind of a quick manner. What, I don't know what, if it's possible for us to get this information from the city. It's only current people that we have. So is it public, Karen, that it's, we can find out who's you know, receiving insurance. Well, we already know who's receiving insurance. Mm -hmm. At least the numbers, the percentage of each committee. Yeah. yeah. Well, but know. it might be, you may want to benchmark against other communities and that could be a call probably to their HR department um, yeah. to find out. 
because I was just gonna say I'd be willing to do that if it's if it's phone calling. You know, I'm still not up to like my regular stuff after getting my knee replaced, but I can certainly make phone calls if we get need some information. You know, rather quickly, I can certainly like Karen said, what you call the HR places and and find out. So it's just I'm gonna throw that out maybe to discuss later. But mm -hmm. if we need that information to kind of make these numbers more valid and and I. I was troubled when Peter brought it up, but then it keeps echoing through this conversation that there are real differences in families that are using it versus families that don't need to use it. God. No. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, Sam. Um, I'd say if you're interested, go ahead and call. I don't think there would be an objection to gathering that information. Um, I'll just state for my own purposes, like I'm not interested in removing anyone's health insurance, like just given the value stated by our city, you know. So I, it, I think it's helpful information to have, but for me personally, knowing that we would, for example, if we were the only ones offering health insurance, that wouldn't sway me to suddenly say, I no longer wanna offer our elected officials who are part-time health insurance. That, yeah, I think I absolutely agree with you. I was thinking more that if we look at compensation and we're trying to have a more diverse population of people that can serve in the city, then we have to look at if this person is not being able to receive, as I understood you all recommended in 2014, that they, they double the stipend if they're not going to, if they don't need to use the insurance. Was that... No, or did I misunderstand that? Yeah, no, it, I, we, they, they were just recommending eliminating the benefits and doubling the stipend so, oh, that every, so, that, so that everybody be getting the same compensation. I see. I'm thinking more keep the benefits as like the basic foundation, but then look at the compensation level because, and I don't know if that would be by doing a sliding scale compensation. I love that idea. I don't know if that's a thing or how quickly we need to know about that. But for, I'm just saying if, there, if there's stuff to be followed through on, we can make that decision. And I know we're not, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm certainly w willing to dig around if there's something I can do here. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that like Sam said, um, I think that if, if you wanted to get in touch with them, it would be very helpful. Um, it might also be good to know that from the committee, whether it would actually make a difference with our recommendation. Okay. It, um, at the end of I the day, do it if it wouldn't make a difference, it's not. Yeah, um, I, I don't know all the details in 2014, other than the fact that there was uh, there was there were a lot of hurt feelings that came out of that period. Um, to be honest, uh, there were recommendations that were made, and and I think there was confusion on behalf of the board at that time that the recommendations would simply be adopted as is which I don't know where that confusion came from um, because it's not the board's decision as to what to do, that we are simply making recommendations. That's all we're doing for the city ultimately to, to decide on. And, and the board, there were people on the board I talked to who from a fiscal standpoint felt that it was very prudent to, to let go of the benefits because the benefit costs are, are skyrocketing every year versus if you just gave a stipend, which would be something to more easily budget over a period of time. So they, they were trying to bring, they, they really were trying to bring um, uh, responsible practices to, mm -hmm. to the situation. But we're, we're also considering this, to be honest, it, more in depth and in a broader, more diverse way than they did in okay. 2014. Uh, which is frankly the right thing to do, yeah. um, but it was something that just wasn't really on the table at that time. Yeah, yeah. I think it sounds to me. We have. I'm sorry, I'll mute. But I just wanted to say, it sounds like I haven't been. I've been missing some of the meetings, but we're all in favor of benefits. I mean, we can't eliminate benefits from people because that will totally strip us of diversity. You know, folks need benefits. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I can't speak for everybody, but that's certainly how I feel. I really feel like right now, I, I don't think it would be advantageous or, or fair to get rid of the benefits. It was something that was considered nine years ago, and it was decided not to do it. Um, I also think there's a practical standpoint is that um, people get used to things that are in place. And when you take things away, 
it creates some real practical problems. Um, so I, there's there's a fairness aspect and there's a practical aspect to this as well. Um, my personal feeling would be to to leave those in place. Um, but again, I'm just speaking for myself at this point. Um, we have nine minutes left. Um, I know that there were a few things as a committee we wanted to touch base on um, beforehand. Is is there anything else um, that we want to discuss before before we move on? All right. Um, thank you all for your work. I really appreciate it. No, thank you for, for coming on and, and being our one visitor and, and a very informative one. Thank you. All right. Have a great night. Thank night. you. Um, so there, there are a few things as that I'd like to that I sent out earlier. Um, as as we've started to draft this report, there are some questions that, that floated to the surface. And as we've gone through this process, those question, those those comments for me were reinforced. One of them um, was, how do we make this process more efficient in the future? Frankly, um, I, this is a very time-consuming process. It's going to end up taking us about seven months. Um, it's a lot to convene these, and it's relying on us pulling together a lot of information that, uh, frankly, I thought the city would probably be able to do in a more efficient and effective way so that a board like ours would have would only have to convene for a shorter period of time and really spend its time and energy thinking about the big questions rather than trying to figure out where we're going to get the data and whether the data is any good to begin with. So um, there were a few things that I sent out that I just want to touch base on and, and was hoping to get some feedback on. Um, and two of them have to do with the process itself. And one of them has to do with the fact, if you read it, that we would rely on the city to get the data together so that the board, when it convened in the future, would only have to consider the data and the recommendations rather than gathering the data. The other one in terms of the process is whether we would recommend that there's a 2.5 cost of living adjustment automatically for the years that the board does not convene, knowing that the board convening the board is difficult, it takes a long time, and if it's 20 to nine to 20 years between um, when the board gets together, to get oops, to get sorry, my my uh, watch is suddenly talking to me. It wants to be part of the conversation. Do not include those in the minutes, uh, Sam. Um, so those are two considerations for how to, in, I think, to improve the process going forward. Um, so uh, do you have, is there any comment or feelings on that? Oh, one last thing. I, I also want to say that I did run the general ideas past Jim Nash, um, who's head of the council, and I also ra ran it past uh, the lawyer with the city. Um, I can't remember his name. Alan already. Seawald. Thank you. With Alan, both of them said that, that that's totally within our purview. If we decide that we want to include that in the recommendations, we can. I, I agree with all of the, the, that you're suggesting. I think it's a, it's a good sound suggestions. Yes, Deb? I, I second that perfectly. I love the cost of living idea because nine years in between, that's a long time. With, as we've seen costs go just in the past few years. So I think excellent ideas. Tara? I like those ideas. I would also like to suggest that a former board member from the last cohort be a part of the new cohort. Um, I, I think that that's a great recommendation. We can't force it, unfortunately. Uh, we did ask, all the members of the last cohort if they wanted to partake in this one and they all said no, <laughs> no. but but, Tara, but Tara's volunteering didn't you get oh, that? Is it <laughs> no I think that that's an excellent recommendation to say reach out to the previous cohort to mm -hmm. um, to see if anyone would participate I, that makes a lot of sense I'm not sure we can um, mandate it but I agree with you it would be a good recommendation I have one more thought. Is there any way to do additional benefits based on annual household income or additional benefits based on number of dependents within a household? 
Yeah, I have I have no idea on either one of those. Um, part of that might have to do. I, I maybe Felicia could answer this um, with the amount of work that would be required. Um, I, I don't know how this is processed and who does it in the city or how much uh, complication that might add. Felicia, any ideas? So I was kind of thinking about that when we were talking about the health insurance, because I was thinking there are some companies that give a stipend to people if they don't utilize the health insurance. Yes. But then you have the complication of, well, do they need a health insurance for a single individual for them plus one person for them plus five people. So I think you, you can't just give like one stipend for health and for not having health insurance because people pay different amounts for different tiers of health insurance. So it's kind of the same thing with, um, you know, looking at household sizes. And then it's like, I, I agree. I like that idea. It's just so hard to look at it because you could get some people who are dishonest and, and say, oh, well, you know, I support my parent who lives in a, a home, but I'm their sole supporter so on a census they're not going to necessarily show as a as a person that lives in that household um and then you could have people living like as being reported as living in the household but maybe they're you know people who are 19 20 years old and they're living on their own and they're not with their parents anymore so i just think i think it's a really good idea i just think it's really hard to get a perspective on who exactly back to the dependence, it's hard to say, say who should be counted and who shouldn't. Um, because, you know, people in your household, you could have, you know, your, all the people in your household could be working and they could be making a, a good amount of money, <laughs> or you could have a lot of small children who are obviously not making any money. So it's, it's just so hard to, to bring that up because so many people have different interpretations of it. Sam? Um, I agree with your recommendations, John, with a couple of caveats. And then I also had a couple of responses to what's been shared. Um, one of the caveats in terms of like asking the city to support with the data collection, I would of course love that. Um, it also to me feels like we're asking our our public servants to do more with less. You know, we, we're seeing budget cuts coming, right? Like. This is additional work that I think in theory, if you're collecting it every year, um, might make the work a little bit easier, but I don't wanna presume um, to know what we're already, you know, our folks have their plates full, um, whether they're full-time or part-time. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if perhaps, um, I mean, it's fine to suggest that, but maybe also including a couple other options, like perhaps the city advocates with the Mass Municipal Association to um, get back on track of, of doing that work to gather it for all municipalities and or perhaps Northampton would like to petition our state um, legislature, legislators, elected officials to explore other types of things like sliding scale um, because it's so time consuming to figure those types of things out because it's so complicated what Felicia and Tara just raised. Um, perhaps seeing if there's a way to outsource that in a way that's still within Massachusetts that would benefit more than Northampton. So maybe it would be appealing um, for um, a, a larger body of like the MMA or um, the executive branch of the state or the state legislature to look at it. Um, just also in response to, it is a time consuming process, but I wanna, and I, I, like I said, agree with your recommendations, John, but wanna clarify that I don't think this committee should meet less. In fact, I was a little dismayed at how short of a time we got to do this work because we couldn't dive into some of these issues more in depth. Um, so while I think it would be great to have any kind of support to make our work more efficient, I wouldn't want to advocate for saying we should meet less than a year or, you know, I think our, our charge is actually, we can meet up to two years. I believe our terms are two years. But like in reality, we really got started in January and we were supposed to have a report in April. That's a really tight timeline to be able to do things in respect, you know, following open meeting law and to dig in and do meaningful work. Um, yep. I'm sorry. Yep. No, go ahead. 
No, I completely agree with you. In, in my mind, when I was imagining the data collection to occur, I actually was not imagining it happening with the city. I would rather have the city put aside a budget for a few thousand dollars and work with the Western Mass Employers Association, for instance, and give them the parameters. They would come back with all the data. That's what they do. You know, they do that. They do it quickly. They know where to go. And um, for a few thousand dollars at most, we would have all the data that we would need, this, that this board would need to, to give due process and consideration to the very things you're talking about. I completely agree with you that the, the part that's been frustrating is it's been so hard just to get the data. And then once you start looking at the data, you start having all these questions and other considerations that we haven't even been able to think about. And I think that that's the meat of the matter for this, for this board, is how do we make sure that we optimize that time? I don't know whether it could be reduced to two months. Maybe that's my fantasy. But really what I'm saying is, is I'm agreeing with you. I just want there to be more time to consider the big questions, not just figure out where we're going to get the data from. Yeah, agreed. Um, and then just in response, like to clarify, you would have to amend the city charter um, to like force someone from a previous committee to be on it. But of course, the invitation, I think, is a great idea. And or maybe it... This doesn't have to be something that's um, written in ordinance or anything, but um, recommending that the the next version of this board kicks off with a presentation from the previous board, um, something oh, like that. That's a great idea. At the bare minimum, that would that's I think that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to just respond to is there is precedent for um, setting increases. Uh, for elected officials in ordinance. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly who it was, but amongst the six benchmarking cities I identified, at least one of them did have it in their ordinance raises for each year. I actually, I think it was East Hampton. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, so just to finish up on this point, um, Sam, as, as Peter and I are working on the first version of this, I think it would, I, I want to make sure I connect with you to get some data points so we can put that into this draft. Okay. Um, all right. So, I mean, we're already over time. Um, Terry, you had another question. Also, why aren't there more people voicing their opinions about this to us? This is, this is tired or try or tied to compensation and benefits, right? We are. Tied. Tired is yeah. okay. So, uh, could you repeat the question and then? Yeah. So I just I don't want to take up any more time. I know we're over time, but you know the fact that Karen's the only one who showed up um, to talk about this. The fact that a lot of humans are motivated by compensation and salary and benefits and things like that. You know, I'm just I'm just curious as to why more people aren't showing up or voicing their opinions or advocating for us to, to formulate an opinion around this. Yeah. So um, one, right. one thing that I noticed with the survey is um, a lot of people said that they liked doing it. Like they, they genuinely just like being involved in, in their local government and part of the, the civics. And that's, I think they're most of the people's primary motivation. So, um, which I thought was surprising because I mean, I guess not that most people are going to be motivated by like $500, but, um, I, I think that's probably why a lot of these people between all of the time that they spend with their regular jobs, plus the meetings that they have for city council, school committee, whatever. Um, and then plus the fact that they just genuinely like being able to serve. I don't think compensation is like, this overwhelming motivator for them. I think it's just like a, a nice perk. I mean, we're all here and we're not being paid. <laughs> Wait, what? Please, we're not getting paid? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Peter, you got to I, I was just going to uh, echo uh, Felicia. It's a guy, I'm sure we've always had this experience. I've been very involved with the New Art Center on Holly Street. And, you know, there were years, and I've been there 14 years now. And, uh, uh, m many of those years, it was over ten hours a week. Yeah, in my, in my, in 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 my my uh, uh, um, remuneration was being able to give lots of money. So when I was uh, going in the opposite, and I did it because I love it. I'm still involved, and I love it. And I'm sure a lot of people who serve on the city the city boards uh, they feel the same way. I think it's a very good point. 
Tara, I was also thinking about this, and this is purely speculation, right? But I think if you're an elected official, um, I think it's really hard to advocate for your own pay increase. It just doesn't look good necessarily. The optics aren't that great. So I, I think I think it's really incumbent on the city to have a regular process in place to review this. I think it's unfair to expect elected officials to then go out and I, I don't think it's going to look good to their constituents that they're that they're even if it's a fair thing to do to ask for more money. Um, I really think the city needs to be a little more responsible in terms of how it how it sets up the processes to make sure that the compensation is fair to those individuals. Um, so I, I suspect that may be one reason why we didn't hear as much or they didn't come by because this, you know, ver versus responding to the survey. I, I think the survey, um, even though it didn't have a large number of people, um, we did get a pretty good response rate for the number of people that we reached out to. I mean, the, the fact that they're ultimately going to be voting on their own pay rates is kind of creepy and it's, I mean, there's no way around it, but I mean, that's, it's a weird system where you vote for your own pay. Right. But at least they're not being, at least they don't have to advocate at the beginning. On right. The vote. There's the difference. Sam? I just, I, my theory for not getting response, I agree with what everyone's saying is also time, right? Like if we had more, Felicia, you spent so much time, Felicia and Tara, I mean, everyone on the committee spent time doing the survey. Could we have done more with it? Sure. Could we have compiled our own list of former elected officials? I could have, but who had, you know, it's the time, right? So that's why I really, I wish we had more time to be able to do more outreach. Yeah. And I totally hear the point that, you know, from folks who replied to the survey, there's this, um, general consensus that they do it for the service, but we're also not, it's, it's a very small group of elected officials. It's only current. And we're not hearing from folks like the general public. Hey, um, if we had a forum, you could ask people, did you want to run and didn't? And what were the deterrents to try to gather a fuller picture, especially when we're talking about increased diversity and representation? Right. Um, so I, I, the, what I want to say at this point with this process is that we have um, an initial draft done, but there are, there's a couple of uh, there's one more important piece that as a group we have not discussed, and that is what do we think the compensation should be, and um, what are the what are the rules for that. Um, so what what I'm going to propose is that uh, Sam, you have some additional data um, that we'd like to weave in. Uh, I think it would be really helpful to take that data, weave it in, um, and then Peter's also reviewing this with me. And technically what we're gonna do is take the report and then give it to the report subcommittee um, that uh, I think is, is I know is Deb, Sam, and Tara on this. But before we even get there, we really should you know, say as, as a group, is this, do we agree with this one last piece? So our next meeting is slated, I believe, for the 24th. It's two weeks out. Um, uh, so I think we may, what, what we may need to do is con just convene another meeting even briefly to discuss about those some, some of those numbers beforehand, just to make sure that we're staying um, on track. But uh, what I want to do is I want I want to follow up with with uh, Peter and Sam, and then I'll get back to the group on that. But so far we're on track. I just I would uh, to complete it when we said we would, and I'd I'd like to keep that. Um, but I'm just giving everyone a heads up as to where we are right now. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Yes, Deb, you have a question. Your hands up. Well, I just was looking at it, and and maybe I got. The wrong draft. I, I see that in my book, I had that you were going to present the draft report. Maybe this is May 1st, but, but to the committee beforehand, but we start a review of the second draft report. I have April 17th for that. That's, week. that's correct. We that's were going to be getting, Peter and I were going to be getting the report out on the 17th. And that's why you know, there's just there's some data points that I really want to go over and make sure as a group that we're in agreement with. Now, we might do that. We might be able to go over that during the second period. We might be able to do that on the 24th. I would just hate to get to the 24th and have us feel that we don't have enough time for the yeah. final recommendations. That's that's my concern. I just don't want so there to be any you, surprises. What would your ideal be of when we would meet then before the 17th? Um, I would, it, it could be on the 17th next Monday. Um, so I don't know whether that's possible for people or not. I know when I sent out earlier, some people couldn't make it on the 17th. 
Uh, is that is next Monday possible for people? Not me. I think it is for me. Sam, it is not for you. But Sam, we could we could get your input. Is that correct beforehand? Yeah, I can share it with like just you, so we're not breaking open meeting live. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, Deb, how about you next Monday? Well, I was looking. I have a post op follow up with my surgeon who tends to run very late. So it's scheduled for 4.30. I may be available, but I may not. Okay. Like I said, so he, he tends to run late. It wouldn't surprise me if I don't hear from him till 5.30. I don't know. Okay. Um, so what is it you need from us though in this? Well, we, so remember the final recommendation says, here's what the current compensation is and here's what our recommended compensation is. Right. We need to, to fit, we need to agree on what that recommended compensation is. Right. Is it 125,000 for the mayor? Are we, you know, are we looking at a, a, a whatever percentage increase for the rest of the positions? We just need to agree on what we think that should be. And, and the information, the comparison that I think Sam, you were talking about earlier, or maybe Felicia, but somebody has this comparison information that you were, we were going over real quickly. You sent that out in what document, just so that I can look at that, because I think it, from my mind, it, I need to look at the comparisons. And I know you went through the information. I just probably didn't see the, the document. No, 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 you didn't miss anything. I verbally gave it tonight. I've only oh. shared it with John and then um, I, I'll put it in tonight's minutes, but I'll, like John said, I'll follow up with him and Peter as well to make sure it's incorporated. Yeah, so you'll put that information so that we have it before yes. the 17th. Because then You'll get it tonight it. in the minute. Tonight. Well, that's good. Right. But so John, would that be helpful then for us to look at that? And then you're saying we need to meet again for what purpose then? The, the, at the end, we, yeah, you know, we, so the final recommendation again is gonna have specific dollar values tied to the compensation. And we just all need to be in agreement on what those dollar values are. So you want that for the 17th draft that you're gonna send out. That's it why you need it for be, that. Right, because in theory, we could wait until the 24th, but that's really our last meeting before we're supposed to wrap up you know, the report and send it off to the city. And I'm just, I just don't wanna to get to the 24th and have there be too many questions and 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 us not feeling comfortable with the final numbers. I just don't want to. I don't want to be that rushed at the very end. So that's why I'm recommending the 17th. And does this have to be in open meeting format, or could we do what Sam was saying? She will send it to you alone if it's information. And if if you know if yeah, we would well, each send it, or would we have to debate about it in open meeting. Well, no, I, I think what can what will happen is that um, Peter and I have already started to share some numbers, but I want to, and so Sam, Peter and I can do that, yeah. but we need to bring that back to the committee as a whole to take yeah. a look at. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Sam. Just a point of clarification, Deb, because you weren't here when Solicitor Seawald shared open meeting law information, but we can't discuss things that we deliberate on with a quorum and that includes serial conversation. So like, if I, like I said, oh, I'll share it with John, but then since John's also talking with Peter and then if you also shared it with John, that serial communication of a quorum. Oh. So just as th that's what, like four of us yeah, can't see. have communication yeah. on something we're deliberating on outside oh. of an open meeting. Yeah, thank you. thank you, Sam. Thanks for that. Um, okay. so. Uh, I mean, the other option would be to look at a different time. So let's say we were to say next Monday, I hate to say this at something like eight o'clock at night or something like that. Would something like that work? <laughs> Sam looks happy. I'm, I mean, for me, I'm out next week, all next okay. week, I'm unavailable. Okay. Um, and next Monday works for me. I mean, I can do, I can do 5.30, I can do a little earlier or a little later, okay. so. Okay. But if we want Sam to join us, could could it possibly be this week later? I mean, this is just Monday. Is that Thanks, possible? Thanks, Kara. Uh, well, I can, I mean, I, we, the other thing we can do too, Sam, is we could talk about this and we could get your input on this since you're going to be involved with this first round of numbers. And Sam, if you, Peter and I can agree on the approach, then uh, I, 
we can we'll be able to present your opinion in that way. Unfortunately, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to defend it if you needed to next Monday. I mean, at the end of the day, you only need a quorum. There's no rec there's no requirement to include me. I appreciate it, but like I, I just can't be there. So if, as long okay. as you have four people, you all can move forward. Okay, so we'll do that then. I'm going to put forward uh, next Monday, and the, specifically what we're going to do is walk through um, some some of the more of the specifics on this report, so that then we can get it to the subcommittee next week, and and who can go through it in, in with a fine tooth comb. Could we do it Let's a do little it. bit later than five thirty, like even five forty five or six, or is that going to be a problem for other people? I can just join in when I get through, I guess. Um, six is fine for me. Felicia, Tara, Peter. Yes. Nodding heads. Okay. So we're going to, we'll do six o'clock next okay. Monday. Thank you. Yeah. On the 17th. On the 17th. That's correct. Um, just publicly stating that someone will be required to take the minutes. Ah, thank you very much. With open meeting law. Yep. Um, who, is there someone who can take the minutes the next? I have to chair, so I can't. That's my I can try, but I definitely won't do as good of a job as Sam does, but I, I will do it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Really, so you'll do great. I'll send you my template so it's set up for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. All right. Any other new business? All right. Um, if there's no new business, move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. I'll second. All right. Okay. Here's the roll call. Um, Felicia. Yes. Sam votes yes. Deb. Yes. Peter. Yes. John. Yes. And Tara. Yes. <laughs> All right, it passes. The meeting's adjourned. Thank you very, very much. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye.